you'll start the record button. So anyway, you know, you can see from the uh, readings this week, we're going to focus a lot on intellectuals. And so I just thought I would put up a, a few pictures here. Angela is obviously an organic intellectual of our class, uh, but she's also broken into the left wing of the traditional uh, intelligence here. She comes from working class background in, in uh, Birmingham. And, uh, you know, we all know her story, but, uh, how she, you know, she's uh, one of us. Uh, the guy in the middle uh, is very important. Um, his name, oh, hi, Dan, glad to see you could make it. The guy in the middle is Stuart Hall. Hello. Hi, Dan. Hey. The guy in the middle is Stuart Hall. Uh, he's a uh, Jamaica-born, but a citizen of the UK and um, is very active uh, with the British uh, New Left. Uh, he's around New Left Review some, but I forget exactly what organizations he was in. But uh, he was known uh, for his uh, clarity of his writings. He particularly did a Jagromskian analysis of the rise of Thatcher, which sort of blew everybody away because he you know, predicted exactly how the Labour Party was going to lose and why. Um, and he also became uh, the founder of what's called cultural studies all around the world now. They all uh, reach back to him. Um, he died just, I think, about two years ago. It was a big loss, but um, he made quite a contribution uh, to uh, Gromsky and in the current age, using Gromsky to inform the British working class and uh, to change the academy by creating the whole field of cultural studies. So now there are cultural studies departments all over the place. I picked Jerry Harris down at the bottom because you know, he comes out of the left. His father fought in the Spanish Civil War. Um, he was an activist with us in the 60s. But he went straight into the factories and he spent quite a few, number, quite a few years in the steel mills in Chicago until they shut down and he was thrown out. And then when he decided to go into the academy, he picked a working class, the Vry Institute, a working class school in the Chicago. And, um, and that's where he um, used that position in teaching working class students there. And he did that to do his research on globalization. And uh, he sort of developed that independently and he helped found, well, he was the key founder of the, of the Global Studies Association, which is now uh, quite a regular thing. So he's a good example of an organic intellectual also. The other little cartoon is, I just picked that because I thought it reminded me of the the youngsters that are rising up in DSA and uh, our, our next generation. So anyway, if you haven't read the, uh, uh, if you have read the uh, assignments, good. If you haven't, uh, read them after the discussion and maybe it'll make a lot more sense to you. Um, so let's uh, dig in. So on the whole question of intellectuals, uh, Kromsky had a, a very unique approach. Um, you know, before him, like in the, in the 1930s, even up <clears throat> to the 1950s, when people thought of the intellectuals, they mainly they mainly thought of the sons and daughters of the bourgeoisie or, you know, the upper middle classes who had uh, gone off to college and, uh, you know, the fraternity jocks and so on. In our country, that changed somewhat after the, after the Second World War when they uh, passed the GI Bill. But, uh, you know, so I would say certainly in the 1930s, um, the left saw the intellectuals as quite something separate uh, from the working class, but uh, at the same time, uh, they saw value in, in winning some of them over. So, Gromsky starts off by saying that uh, all men and women were intellectuals, which is a, uh, an interesting concept. He says, in that they pondered their fate and learned from their work. Um, he also made, out the, made the point that the uh, just because you could fry an egg or mend your coat, it didn't mean you were a cook or a tailor. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the, 
So he's just by saying that all men and women were intellectuals, he's making a point. Um, but he also is uh, presenting a challenge. Um, so, um, so this was a, a departure um, from the usual uh, pedagogy that he was going on before. And, um, and uh, his distinction between traditional and organic is that these traditional intellectuals always saw themselves as independent. And uh, Gramsci made the point that uh, he didn't think they really were, or at least most of them weren't. And so that's why he called them traditional because they were, you know, they were positioned in the, uh, in very secure positions in, in high universities or they were, you know, had, you know, literary critics or authors of a number of books and so on and made their living that way. And, uh, and that they were usually tied to different sectors of the bourgeoisie, whether it was the liberals or conservatives or somewhere in between. Now and then there were some radicals on the left wing of it. Uh, and he wasn't against winning those guys over. Um, in fact, he was very much for it. At the same time, his basic distinction and his main focus was on the intellectuals that were organic to the working class. And um, by framing things in this way, the way I would put it is that Gramsci was democratizing the analysis of Marxism vis-a-vis -vis the intellectuals and anticipating uh, the kind of changes that mass production would make in terms of heightening the mental skills and the mental labor that was implied in mass production. And uh, so, in this sense, by expanding the concept of intellectuals into the working class, so it's a strata, not a class, it's a strata that spans classes, Gomsky is giving a much more democratic uh, dimension to intellectuals, and at the same time, uh, expanding the sphere of democracy and the potentials of the actual working class. So I think that that's one thing that uh, we want to take a look at it. If you look down here in this third um, thing, it's about Bordiga. I've had, I just laughed out loud when I read this. So Bordiga, Gromsky was running this line down inside the Italian Communist Party. So Bordiga, uh, uh, he thought it was stupid. He made a joke about it. He ridiculed it. He says, if we want a party that spends time studying and learning, we should simply be a party of school teachers. <laughs> <laughs> so he believed that it was enough for him and a few friends to do the party's thinking about theory and strategic politics for the rest of the party. They should simply learn to be more firm and diligent in carrying out their tasks. So I think, you know, by Bordega taking such an extreme position here against Gromsky, you begin to see the difference and why I, I would claim that Gromsky is, in his whole approach here, he's, he's democratizing uh, the question. Um, the pictures here, the one I picked above is just sort of a nice um, you know, graphic about intellectual work, and, you know, the pen, the press, media, and studying books. Uh, and it, makes this, it sort of symbolizes intellectual work. Um, but uh, the picture in the middle is a, a good friend of ours. She spoke at one of our SDS conventions, Jamala Rogers, and she's definitely an organic intellectual comes from a working class background in the St. Louis area. And uh, she's a leader of um, the organization of Black Struggle, main struggle organization there. She's published, I think this is not her first book. And this is one that's just come out. Um, it's about Ferguson in America. And um, so I would say that she is a, a prime example of what Gromsky's talking about when he means, when he's talking about organic and intellectuals organic to our class and in her case also organic to the revolutionary you know dimension of the african-american people as well down here in the bottom i put gromsky in there because uh well we all know gromsky we've read his books he's made uh, invaluable contributions on any number of questions especially the one on manufacturing consent but gromsky is still very much a traditional intellectual and uh even though he's the he's the far left wing of it, and I'm glad I'm glad we've won him over. <laughs> so, but there is a difference between 
Gromsky and uh, Jamal Rogers. Uh, so that's really. Well, do you we, mean you mean um, Noam Chomsky? Yeah, that's Noam Chomsky. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, so you can see the difference between you between the two of them. Right. And, and uh, so, so Gromsky, he's ensconced there with tenure at, at MIT, and he's probably a very wealthy man these days. Mm -hmm. uh, but he's still, you know, he's still on the far left of the, you know, the, what we call the traditional intelligence. Yeah. Right. So anyway, the main point here is, is that Gromsky wants to examine all of these so we can especially develop the contingent of organic intellectuals so he can uh, win them to Marxism and his his version of the party, which is which is called the modern prince. So what the modern prince I mentioned before was to be the instrument for counter hegemony. So let's let's go into that a little. I think the pictures here tell something. This, I love this quote from Malcolm X. He says, if you're not careful, the newspapers will have you hating the people who are being oppressed and loving the people who are doing the oppressing. Uh, so um, Malcolm was a early media critic and uh, he did it in such a way to try to develop a counter hegemonic point of view within the African-American people's movement. And uh, the other picture down here in the bottom, I just picked it out as an example of counter of agitprop or agitational uh, cartoons and whatnot that can be counter hegemonic. Usually, um, you know, with this one quick quip, they expose the existing hegemony. And uh, in this case here, you got Wonder Woman and uh, what she's saying to all these other superheroes, if I don't get pants, no one's get pants. <laughs> and so then you see all these masculine superheroes, you know, dressed up in the, the same kind of, you know, sexually revealing <laughs> costumes that she is. So she's making a, a concept of, you know, she's poking fun at patriarchy is what she's doing and making it look ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So in that way, she's undermining um, the dominant uh, patriarchal uh, block. And, and uh, it's just in this one cartoon, it's just like a, a zinger that takes it on. And uh, I think if Gromsky saw it and understood the context, he would approve of it <laughs> a great deal. Uh, getting back to hegemony, in kind of hegemony, we've got to look at hegemony a little bit more again. And it's a case where, you know, we've said that domination is ruled by naked force. Uh, hegemony, however, also draws out consent from its subalterns, a degree of consent. And this is a point that's important to make here, necess that this necessarily require, requires a degree of compromise. It's not just by spinning false, uh, spinning different yarns uh, and uh, misleading people through many of um, according to the ebb and flow of class struggle, the the dominant dominant uh, uh, class has to has to make compromises uh, in order to keep its hegemony. There has to be a degree of compromise. And uh, for example, we've talked a little bit about the New Deal before, and that's where you know at the arms uh, argued that the workers should be allowed a unions and to have a contract. Um, that's a step forward, but. Implicit in every contract, however, is that the bosses remain bosses and the workers remain subalterns. So that's how, in a way, compromise can help stabilize a shaky uh, hegemonic block. So since uh, economic conditions are always changing, so do the terms of the contracts and so on. So what all this means is that these things become terrains, but uh, Trump's use is the word terrain, terrains of struggle. and he, he, he applied them every, everywhere, not only, he certainly went beyond the, the traditional trade union, you know, struggling for a good contract, uh, although he wasn't against that, but he also extended it, you know, that's why the workers' councils were set up in the factories, and why he, um, uh, this, you know, convinced against Bordiga, he got people to run in elections, uh, because he saw all these as terrains of class struggle, and he also extended it 
famously from the very beginning of his work into the fields of culture as well that you had to try to find ways to undermine a punk protest or present alternatives to the dominant culture. So in all these terrain battles, Gramsci wants the working class to understand itself fully beyond just selling its labor, making products and getting cash. He wants, here's a, he wants, um, this is pretty much straight from him. He wants to see the irrationality and injustice of the existing order and its ability as a working class to create and manage a new order. So it's not just that you're, you're fighting uh, for, uh, say, uh, single-payer health care. In the course of fighting for single-payer uh, health care, where it's appropriate, you want to you know, educate people that what we really need in the long run is a new order altogether. That might take us a while to get there, but uh, it's important uh, to talk about it in order to build the modern friends. We don't have to worry about occasion, teach, teachable moments because capitalism itself constantly supplies us with conflict and crises. Uh, but what we have to learn is how to turn these into teachable moments while we're waging a particular struggle. We also have to understand that our instrument that's waging a struggle is also to see itself as a school. And so that's why we're, we use uh, struggle to turn these teachable moments to develop the modern prince to do the teaching and the counter hegemonic can begin to develop. So here we're gonna we're talking about teaching and learning. We have to talk we have to go to the very beginning. We have to talk some about consciousness. It's not only teaching that you have to understand consciousness, just in any kind of organizing you really you really have to uh, address the question. And I like this, these uh, three points at uh, Gromsky. I think he got these from Liebnick, but he, he put them on a, as, on a motto of his uh, newspaper, The New Order. Educate yourselves because we'll need all your intelligence. Stir yourselves because we need all your enthusiasm. Organize yourselves because we'll need all your strength. I think that that's a very good summation of what he's about. I put these pictures up here in order to say something. Um, this first graphic, I think it's very good because um, obviously makes the point that in order to, to lead a battle for emancipation, you have to first emancipate your mind. And to be able to emancipate your mind, you have to look at it. So I thought that graphic, <laughs> uh, captured the idea of looking, you know, uh, trying to look into, understand your own thinking. Um, and the fact that there's a rupture here shows that it's not so easy sometimes uh, to take a critical look at yourself and your circumstances. Uh, and um, sometimes it's, it seems almost impossible because this guy keeps turning around so fast that you can't, you know, this guy can't get a look at him. <laughs> When you're, when you're trying to chase the elusive character of the, what's, what George Herbert Mead called the eye of the me. Uh, he, said, he said the self had two aspects to it, the me, which was social, and the eye, which was individual. Anyway, here, here's the eye looking at the me. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, a, uh, that's what that's for. The one in the middle is uh, just a group of workers uh, in a study group, union study group. I don't know what it is that they're studying, but it basically shows, you know, workers have to, they don't have to do this by themselves. It often works well if they do it together. And uh, the bottom picture uh, comes from the 1970s. This is a picture of one of the early consciousness raising groups that started in New York and then they swept all around the country. And I think, I mean, I think every woman in my generation probably took part in the consciousness consciousness raising group at one time or another. I don't know if the young women today are still doing them, but uh, we certainly went through this period. And uh, they, when they first started out, they were called speak bitterness meetings. And the speak bitterness was, you know, this was the ideas that people would get there and they would, they would talk about themselves. 
in their own experience at mistreatment by men. And the idea was that when they did that, other women would recognize themselves in what was said and that they received that they were not alone. Speak bitterness. Uh, they, it was a term they actually borrowed from the Chinese. During the course of the Chinese Revolution, uh, in all the areas that were liberated, and in, also in the base areas, they, um, uh, the Chinese Communist Party was very big on organizing the women to rise up. And uh, so what the, they were starting to build a women's organization, they called it Half of China. And uh, the way it would organize is that uh, they would have the women come in a village, peasant women m most commonly, come into uh, get together and they would speak bitterness. They would talk about their oppression as children, their oppression uh, under their mother-in-laws, their oppression under their their uh, husbands who would beat them or whatever. And uh, anyway, that's where the term bitterness came from. And out of this, they grew a huge and a very powerful women's organization at the grassroots level, which is called Half of China. And uh, if a husband was you know, beating his wife in a village, um, one of the women would come to him and said, you better change your ways, buddy, otherwise half of China is going to get on your get on your <laughs> case <laughs> so, and uh, they did and uh, they were very effective so this was uh, kind of very Gromsky because Gromsky loved the use of point about educators from the Latin educare means to lead or to draw out it's not to pound in <laughs> it's not just to take you know, take some reading some, from Marx or, and pound them into your head, you know. You wanted to draw out people's experience and then mix it up, you know, take, you know, help use some Marxism books and so what to help expand on it. But the most important thing was the leading, drawing out from people's own lives. So first was to find out that they're not alone. And the second, he encouraged people to continue study reading and putting wider ideas and the ability to challenge and question them to seek one's own place and mission in the entire world he kept encouraging what workers to look beyond themselves because he wanted to see them not as, as wage earners who needed a higher wage he wanted them to come to see themselves collectively as a, as a new ruling class that they could actually be masters of their factories act masters of their town uh, masters of uh, their country, and uh, so that was uh, that was the importance of it. The last point down here, Gomsky uses the two. He says all consciousness was conflicted. It was, and this is a very important concept. I'll go into it more later. It's a combination of common sense. By which he common sense, he meant folklore, religious dogma, any beliefs which were widely held and often fatalistic. So, in the, in talking about common sense, Gramsci's terms is quite different than the, than the term common sense we use. I mean, there's some overlap, but we usually use common sense in a different way. It's, it's important to understand it, how he's using it here. And he says, but there's also what people learn in solving problems, whether at work or at home, uh, gaining skills in life and so on. Uh, this is uh, the root of science, and this is also the root of what he called good sense, which we'll get into uh, later on. Uh, anytime you wanna, any, any of you wanna uh, stop me or raise a question, you're welcome. But uh, I'll just keep moving on here. So here's conflicted consciousness. I think we need to think about this a while. I put some pictures up here to kind of get it uh, in an emotional way through some of the pictures. Picture on the top gives you an idea of a person who's somewhat anguished and torn. And uh, so really? That, uh, huh? <laughs> really? <laughs> yes, it's true. <laughs> I think I think so. And down here in the middle is a, a different way of looking at uh, conflicted consciousness. See here, 
see one person with uh, dual aspects, uh, you know, up here in the heavens and down, rooted down here in the ground. But it, it you know, the radiance of it um, gives you the idea that there's some energy behind it. Uh, and there's an energy for change, which leads to the one down here, where you should see a certain, you know, the, the painting gives you a certain sense of unity and struggle and going on the offensive. Um, but here's the, up here, n neither Marx nor Gramsci ever used the term false consciousness. Now, I don't know about the rest of you, but I spent 30 years of, at least 30 years of my life, um, not only using the term, but, you know, giving study groups on it and whatnot. And there's whole books written on it uh, by different famous Marxists. I think Marx himself never used the term. Angus used it only once when he was writing a letter to somebody. And he just sort of in passing dropped the phrase. But but uh, Gramsci uses conflicted consciousness. And the reason I think it's important is because once again, I think he's democratizing the issue. He used the term false consciousness. It implies that there's such a thing as true consciousness. And true consciousness is, uh, has two things wrong with it. One, it's kind of metaphysical. But the other is it's, it's disdainful. Because what you're saying, well, the workers here have false consciousness. What you're saying is that you have true consciousness. And you set yourself somewhat above them uh, by that way. And what Gramsci's telling you to do here is it's saying everybody has conflicted consciousness. None of us are free from it. We may have it in different degrees and in different ways, but he wants, you know, with people like us uh, to approach workers who are, say, le have, uh, voted for Trump in the last election, is uh, to, to approach each other with a kind of mutual respect, listening to their ideas, they listen to our ideas. He, he kind of wants a democratic engagement and dialogue. Now there's some, obviously, that, you know, people that you, you know, are, are not going to change, at least, you know, uh, not, in, not, not in their lifetimes, like Mao said, everybody can change, but some people die first. But, mm. uh, but uh, um, so anyway, I think it's a more democratic use, and it's one that, uh, that challenges us uh, to try to understand ourselves, too, to see how, to see how our own consciousness is contradictory. And, um, you know, so of the two theoretical consciousnesses is the way Ramsey uses the phrases, and one of which is implicit in his activity and which in reality reminds him with all his fellow workers. That means, you know, the consciousness that grows out of his experience at work and, and manufacturing and whatnot, that is one basis. And then the other is the old, what he meant by common sense, which is super... Uh, which he thinks that he's inherited from the past and uncritically absorbed, he or she, I should say. And this ties in, you know, I just put this phrase in here because, you know, Marx makes the point how the tradition of all dead generations weighs like a nightmare on the brains of the living. Hmm. And that, that includes us as well as, uh, you know, the, you know, the rank and file workers, we know. So in other words, what Gramsci's trying to point out here, and then uh, we'll go back up here to this top picture again, uh, that any given self is a dynamic hologram. Gramsci doesn't use that word as mine, but uh, I think that is a good way to think about it. It's a holo any given self is a hologram of identities, interests, values, memories, stores of knowledge and relationships, some conflicting, others reinforcing and interconnected with other selves. So this becomes, once again, a terrain of struggle. What that means is that this is, this is what we're talking about when we talk about ideological struggle. We try to uh, dig in to we actually, what we try to do is elicit from people we're engaged with, what are their identities? How do they see themselves? They see themselves as whites, 
uh, or workers, or both? How do they do they see themselves as Christians above all, or is that just you know one part of them? What their values are, you know, whether the values are tolerance, you know, you know any of the range of different values, mutual aids, solidarity. Those are the ones that we want to encourage. We try to draw out memories, stores of knowledge, things that they've learned from their families or relationships and so on. And in doing so, if we're skilled permanent persuaders, we'll find ways to take what's positive and, and, and how, how people express themselves and use it and mobilize all those positive factors to isolate and uh, the most negative factors. And how, you know, then not only through discussion, but then through experience, begin to shift uh, people's consciousness. It's usually best to do this kind of stuff after you've, you get people to act first. And once they've taken it, no matter how small it is, if you get people to act first, to go on a picket line, to go ride a bus to Pittsburgh, ride a bus to Harrisburg, get them to take an action. And then after you've taken action, then you can talk, reflect on it. And then you do this kind of, you operate on this kind of terrain. And this is uh, how you go about one-on-one -on -one on shifting consciousness. But it shouldn't all only be done one-on-one. -on -one. We have to do it we have to wait, do this in the public forums and all the uh, mass propaganda and agitation and so on that we do. But we should understand that that's how, we're, how we should try to speak to people uh, and how we should try to draw things out and... Uh, and um, take the use of positive, use of positive to overcome the negatives. And uh, this this is the task of the organic intellectuals to shape and grow the modern prince. A little more about the modern prince here uh, to get into it. Organized will is the term I put up to it. Um, the party gives birth to the new organic intellectuals, the working class, but these are protagonists is the word that uh, Gomsky uses. In fact, here's a quote from him. If yesterday the subaltern element was a thing, today it is no longer a thing, but an historical person or protagonist. So uh, here's a, you know, just a symbol from the, from the party after the uh, war. I put this picture of Jody Foster in here because I think, and um, Lecter Hannibal Lecter back there. I think most people have seen the film, The Silence of the Lambs, but it's a good example of what being a protagonist means. Her role in that movie is that she's a female protagonist and she ultimately overcomes uh, Lecter. So she's a protagonist. Down here on the lower picture, these are Italian working class women. Uh, just at the time where they overthrew Mussolini. And you can see their protagonists too. <laughs> They're walking down the street carrying their guns and submachine guns and such, showing that they mean business. Uh, so that was part of the, you know, the overcoming of the fascist uh, government and a fascist movement by the communists at the, at the end of the war. Um, Wherever there's oppression, there's resistance. And this is, this is an objective factor independent of our will. So what matters to uh, Gomsky is how our will is organized and given a forceful expression within these conditions. So here we're Jody, Fo Jody Foster's being a, an individual protagonist. And these women down here are just, uh, there are just three of them, but Gomsky wants the entire you know party, the entire modern prince to be a collective protagonist for the working class, for its uh, aspirations to be to to, um, to form a new order. So his intellectuals, he makes this point too. This is a kind of important. Gomsky's intellectuals are not simply to be learned or eloquent. He says that would make them into a priesthood. Uh, he insisted that. Uh, the organic intellectuals had to share life and battles with the workers and all the other subalterns. Because he wanted them not only uh, to have all these um, ideas, he wanted them to share their passions. Uh, 
And he felt that without also sharing the passions of the people that you were working with, uh, there would be no uh, revolutionary insurgencies. There might be up, you know, battles and so on, but to have a really revolutionary insurgency, you had to have the, he, he felt the, um, the subjective factor of the party and his sharing uh, the passions of the people and being integrated with them um, made a big difference in this regard. So here's where we get into um, something that I've spelled out. I tried to do a few times since on some of my Facebook pages, and uh, but it's fairly important. And Randy pointed out a very good book on it, uh, um, Gramsci and Tahir, and meaning the square in Egypt, and where that huge crowd uh, drawn out. And uh, there's another book also on common sense. I was written by a woman whose name escapes me at the moment. Anyway, the, both of them are pretty good. So, common sense doesn't necessarily mean it's true. That's for, for one of the reasons here, I put, uh, I forget what town this is from, I think it's an Ohio newspaper. Uh, there's a banner headline, 11 top red leaders convicted by jury. And at the same time, people in this country were saying, oh, this is a free country. So. Uh, that was common sense at the time. We have a free country, but this was common sense too, that the red leader should be thrown in jail. So you have a conflict there, but it's, uh, and it's, uh, you know, within people, it's a conflict within people's thinking. Uh, so they might not think it is con uh, conflicting, but it indeed is, and eventually it crushes up on it. This was a kind of amusing cartoon I came across. Uh, that, that makes use of old comic book characters. Um, this is from an Archie comic. And there's Betty. And there's Mrs. Grundy, who is usually the grumpy old school mom. In this case, the, the roles are reversed. And uh, Mrs. Grundy is uh, giving Betty a stern talking to. Nonsense, girly. Knowledge is power. Women should be rewarded for their brains and their skills. He's trying to break up. You got Mrs. Grundy trying to break up the, the kind of, uh, you know, romanticism built around beauty and appearance that uh, her and Veronica are always into. She's trying to um, break them out of their, of the, some of this, uh, to widen their horizons, let's say. Um, so that, um, that's the reason why I put there. Mrs. Uh, Grundy's trying to, Offer some good sense to uh, Betty. So it's good uh, common sense is what we absorb under the hegemony of everyday life, the ruling ideas of our time and history. Work hard, get ahead. America's the greatest country in the world. The rich get rich and we get screwed. Nothing ever changes. So all of this is um, a part of the common sense. And some of it is even self-contradictory. Some of it is even uh, positive and true. The problem is it's got cynicism laced into it, which uh, disarms it, which disarms it. And, um, I think, uh, you know, we obviously know the, the danger of uh, somebody's making a racket. Uh, folks, you need to mute your phones, please. I think that may be you, Barbara. Am I muted? No. Am I muted? Oh, that or you're on there, Tina? Yeah, I thought I was muted. It said I was oh. muted. I don't know how to mute myself. Okay. So anyway, you're not the, the racket's gone now, so whatever you were doing, don't do it again. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay. It was emptying uh, the waste can. Okay. <laughs> um so, you know, we can probably think of hundreds of, you could probably sit down and, and think of hundreds of examples of these things, things that you hear every day. And uh, we all know that how white chauvinism plays an extremely divisive and uh, weakening role in the movement. But cynicism does too. And, um, you know, you know uh, Leonard Cohen has a, uh, a great song about cynicism. And, uh, it has a, everybody knows, everybody knows the dice was loaded, so, so on. It's, yeah. 
And uh, there's an American uh, social philosopher who uh, was inspired by the song. Uh, I forget his name. It uh, starts with an A. But anyway, the name of the book is Everybody Knows. Yeah. And um, it it um, tells you the uh, the uses of cynicism. And uh, what cynicism is, is I call it a little cop that the bourgeoisie has implanted in our brains. And it always whispers to us two lies. And the two lies are nothing changes and you have no power. The truth is everything changes. And uh, the other truth is we have enormous power if we connect with each other. Uh, but that little cop of cynicism can be used to hold people back. So we're not really sometimes used to taking people on because of their cynicism. But I think we should find some ways to challenge it every now and then, especially to get, you know, to get people to think critically about their cynicism when it comes up um, and uh, uh, draw them out about it. Because it, uh, it's important to being able to undermine self uh, um, common sense. So our job is to tease good sense out of common sense. And we do this by questioning our experience, seeking truth from facts and practice. And we can do it because everybody's life also includes good sense. There's a certain dimension of good sense and that we have to find out what that is in people and to build and expand upon it. So re reading and study help, uh, adding to the immediate good sense, which taken as whole, can become revolutionary consciousness. So that's the sort of the end goals we want to get from conflicted consciousness to revolutionary consciousness. That doesn't mean it's still not going to have conflicts in it, but it, uh, the, the revolutionary side will have the upper hand. And when you're at that point, you become part of the modern prince and join in this praxis. <laughs> a praxis is a, a word people stumble over sometimes. I wonder what the hell, why you have to spell it with an X. Uh, but uh, we'll talk about it here because uh, it's somewhat important. At least uh, you don't have to use it in everyday life. It's important to understand what it means and why uh, Gramsci and other people use it. So I put the sort of a definition of it here, the dynamic and practical side of a theoretical field of study as opposed to the theory alone. I thought this was a, I found this button um, on the internet. I thought this was a, a pretty good uh, thing. And it's, it's kind of what I was uh, saying before. You know, first you act, you act together. You find a way to act together and get workers to act together and take an action of some sort. doesn't matter how big it is, writing a letter or even making a call or going to. And then once you've taken the action, you reflect on it. And then in reflecting on it, you try to take it to a higher level, the theory. And then if this is an ongoing circle of activity, Marx called it practical, critical activity in the 11 Theses on Forbach. And that's where it came from. So Gramsci used it, and it was also used in the uh, late 1950s by uh, some Yugoslav communists who were trying to trying to create 21st century socialism, even though they were still in the 1950s. <laughs> they, they did some good things, but they, weren't, they put out a journal that came out for a couple of years, and the journal was called Praxis. And uh, um, it was read by proto Gramskians and others for a while and had some interesting insights. So the philosophy of praxis, then, is not just another name for Marxism that Gramsci uses to get past his prison censors. It's also many times it's another interpretation of Marxism. Uh, and that they use it in a kind of more dynamic and, and dialectical way than just kind of rote learning or uh, absorbing lessons that are uh, handed down to you. And uh, more than it's more than just a... Uh, a radical critique of political economy and history. Marxism is also a philosophy of action and engagement. 
he's trying to emphasize the, the dynamic here and meant that the prax the organic intellectuals had to put their shoulders to the wheel of organizing for revolution and the approach to it. And there I mentioned the theses on Feuerbach, which are rather short. You can look them up and uh, see how. I gave some pictures here, but I thought were good examples. These ones up here above are the radical praxis of the Lincoln, uh, Abraham Lincoln's wide awakes. Uh, Randy, I think I've talked about this before, Randy and Tina know what they are. When Lincoln was um, running for president, he had a huge mass youth movement uh, behind him in the hundreds of thousands. They started in New England, but they went all the way across into Illinois. And uh, they organized these marches at night and uh, they didn't say anything. They just held up torches. They all wore black uh, slickers um, because the, the oil was uh, would dripping down and wouldn't uh, put their clothes on fire. And they, they would usually have a marching band and drum. They would just come out at night in this town and march all up and down the streets in this huge army and had a powerful effect. And they were saying that the, we're wide, wide awake, you know, they had waken up and that's why uh, Lincoln and the new party he represented, uh, it was a, you know, a mass youth movement basically that, that uh, had a powerful praxis uh, that helped Lincoln get elected. Later on, they also were the ones, the first ones uh, to volunteer in the fighting the Civil War. And uh, down here in the bottom is another uh, case of uh, radical revolutionary praxis. Uh, these are all uh, returning GIs, uh, uh, you know, from the uh, uh, war in Vietnam, uh, organized themselves. And uh, I think I know this guy here is Bob Spiker. Anyway, um, anyway, they're they're making a very clear statement here. We're going to fight another rich man's war, and uh, they had a you know we all remember the powerful impact that they had on the nature of the anti-war movement. So this is, sort of, this is sort of the praxis is sort of what you want to, how you want to enhance an organizer so that they're able to, to take these kinds of, um, you know, basic movements and turn them into and draw the people into, into the modern prince, uh, the future ruling class. So that's what the, the term, that's one way to look at the term praxis uh, when you when you see it okay here's a point where um, I talk a little bit about uh, Gromsky was not only concerned about Italy and the war and fight against fascism he also uh, was of the opinion that Marxism was based on the most advanced expression of the productive forces. And he was always concerned that, you know, like we saw earlier, where he mentions that the society makes no demands on itself that it's not capable of fulfilling. And he was extremely interested in Henry Ford. Uh, and um, a lot of the different things that uh, developed at that time. And, um, Gromsky was, uh, you see this term Fordism now, nowadays in a lot of academic sociology papers and so on, was actually coined by, well, I don't know if it was coined by uh, Gromsky, but he's the first one who, who spoke of it in, those, in this way. Uh, he, and that's what his, his, he wrote some articles on it. Uh, but uh, here's some of the uh, portrayal of it. It was sort of satirized by Charlie Chaplin and this is his uh, movie. If you, I don't know if you've ever seen it. I have. It's really funny. As Charlie Chaplin caught up in the gears of the machine here. Uh, the cartoon is called, um, the movie's called Modern Times. If you can find it, I'm sure you can find it on YouTube. It's worth watching if you haven't, haven't seen it. That's, here's a picture of uh, Ford's assembly line. Let's talk about Ford for a minute. Because... Uh, um, we all know, you know, how reactionary and fascist he was and how, what he came up with. But if you look back on his entire life and overall what he did, he was, uh, he revolutionized production. Uh, and with a moving assembly line, 
he had gone to he had been building cars the old-fashioned way the same way some of the other uh, car manufacturers were built and he kept trying to make a breakthrough so he had the, the innovative idea um, he went to Chicago and he sat and studied the meat packing plants mm. And um, he sat there and studied them and studied them. And, uh, and if you know anything about meat packing plants, they start off by killing the cows and you have the whole cow on one end of its moving chain. And as it moves along, different things get cut off and different people have different, different workers have different things. So by the end, you know, they said they said at the end the only thing that was left of the pig was the squeal. <laughs> so everything was cut out and went to some another person or whatever to turn into something else or some other part. So Ford had the brilliant idea of seeing the thing in reverse, starting with all the little parts along a moving line, and having workers assigned to just do one thing. Now, there were certain assembly lines like this and standardization of parts that was done mainly because of the Civil War earlier and uh, mass producing weapons. So it wasn't like it was completely original with him. But the idea of taking it and applying it to manufacturing of automobiles was. So the first aspect of Ford, of Fordism was this uh, moving assembly line where the workers stayed in one place and the product moved and the workers repeated their actions. And as a result, he was able to produce a, a Model T, to, he'd reduced the time to make a Model T down to 93 minutes. And he divided the process of production into 40, was 45 steps. And uh, so this was a big deal. Um, but he had another uh, revolutionary notion that goes into Fordism. He wanted to pay his workers enough five dollars an hour, which was double about double what the average factory wage was back then. He so said Ford, um, um, wait, you know, pay, paid his workers a very high wage, and the reason he did it was so that they could buy his cars for a, a, a month's wage. So workers said. A month's wage by a worker would add up enough to buy a car. A lot of the workers, if they were working uh, six and six and a half hours a day, they were too tired to do anything with the damn cars. So he also decided to institute the uh, the five a day, forty hour week. And the reason is, is that he wanted the uh, workers. Uh, this, he wanted to turn cars from playthings for the rich into necessities for workers and farmers. In other words, he wanted to create a mass market for them. And in order to do that, he had to uh, change the structure and uh, a payment of the working class in order for to create that market. So it's these things taken together, not only the assembly line, but the restructuring and the workforce and its conditions that come up to Fordism and the, the uh, the Fiat factories in uh, in Turin um, didn't do anything like, weren't anything close to what Ford was doing, and uh, that's why uh, both Lenin and uh, Vronsky were interested in doing this. You know, to find out what they could learn from it, what you know, what positive any positive aspects they could learn from it, in order to apply it to uh, so a socialist uh, construction. Gromsky was never in a position to do it, but Lenin was, uh, and so Lenin was uh, interested too. Uh, Ford uh, also uh, tried to take a more total view of the worker, and uh, he had experiments. He did experiments with organizing workers' entire lives. So it was not only organizing their time on the on the uh, on the uh, production line. He also tried to organize their cultural life, uh, how they spent their money, whether they were good Christians, whether they went to proper churches. And he set up after work schools for them in order to train them in these habits. A lot of the workers thought they were ridiculous. 
They'd rather be spending their time in a local bar. Uh, but uh, Ford was very much against that. He wanted to crack down on it. And, um, you know, he was uh, especially cracking down on them for things like drinking, gambling, and mistreatment of their families. Some of that had a positive side to it, but mainly it was all coming from without and by, you know, your boss, a tyrannical boss. And uh, Gromsky was very critical of Ford's uh, efforts in this regard. He wanted to develop a, um, the moral and culture of the working class, but he wanted to work on a Christian basis, but on the basis of mutual aid, solidarity, and the other uh, positive values of working class culture. So in that sense, he was, he was, uh, he was critical of Ford. Uh, down here is just a, a picture of you know workers hanging out in the bar after work, and in the, in these times, this is a you know, somewhere around 19, late 1920s, I would say, probably at the time that painting was made. Um, so socialized. Okay, here's um, Ford's newspaper, the um, the Dearborn Independent, uh, the International Jew. The workers problem and then uh, he printed the protocols of the elders of zion and all kinds of anti-semitic stuff in here he was really you know you know mentally i would say mentally ill <laughs> his anti-semitism was just deep uh, but the thing that some people don't understand about the dearborn independent it wasn't only a local paper in dearborn bundles of these papers were sent to every uh ford dealer across the country and with every time you bought a new Ford, you got a subscription uh, to the Dearborn Independent. <laughs> so um, eventually Ford had to drop this because he had a lot of bad reaction to it. But in any case, uh, that, you know, he really tried to uh, spread this for, um, far and wide. So Gromsky saw, uh, you know, there were attempts to bring Fordism into the Fiat factories and, but he saw Italians resisting it, but he thought they were often uh, for the wrong reasons. And uh, one was that the surplus value needed for the transition was be, being drained by what the, the parasites in Italy, you had a lot of paras parasite classes. These were all the different uh, strata left over from feudalism. And they just basically had to get a piece of, they, they got what were called rents Basically, they were sustained by payments from the state. And so this reduced the size of the surplus and it re reduced the ability of uh, the capitalists to make more modern equipment. And most of these parasites were hung from the old landlords and clergy, the monarchy, and they held Italy back. And Gromsky argued that since Americans weren't cluttered with all these feudal remnants, it was quicker to modernize. And um, whether it was for good or bad, he wasn't quite sure. He was just studying it in his notebooks. Uh, he didn't really come to conclusions. He understood Marx on the question of automation. Uh, in other words, the more money into new machines, the less living labor is needed. Thus, labor time and the price would eventually uh, decline towards zero over the you know, long arc of history, and markets would wither away. He understood that point abstractly. But he wasn't um, sure about how to get the full benefit or avoid worse results of the transformation. A transformative change was needed. And I would say, in, in summing up and reading on, on the, his uh, points about this stuff, that he was asking all the right questions about it. And uh, he believed in human agency and an open future, but he wasn't sure exactly what the answers were. Uh, and it's understandable because he was locked up in jail and couldn't see it all. Um, the thrust towards, uh, you know, modernism and new technology, you can see in this uh, Art Deco painting of the time, uh, which really emphasizes a kind of high energy and futuristic look at things. And, uh, power of technology, uh, and both the left and the right made use of these. Uh, this kind of uh, this kind of art, you know, this interwar art, I call it, from the end of World War One to the beginning of World War Two, 
and uh, it sort of, you know, uh, sums it up. But Gromsky really felt that um, it was important for a Marxist analysis not to be bringing up the rear because you're going to be siding with the backward forces, you know, people who want to suppress uh, certain changes. Our job was to try to break on through to the other side and fight in a way that these uh, uh, changes that eliminate toil uh, could be used for the benefit of the working class and figure out how to wage those struggles. And uh, he didn't come to clear conclusions on it because he didn't have time. Um, and he had to, you know, this, this was towards the end of his notebooks and he was, uh, his health was suffering. So here we get to the, the end of our story, uh, Gromsky's death. Here's a front page of the cry of the people and the, with the banner headline across, um, Antonio Gromsky is dead. And uh, they blame the fascists for his uh, assassination, they call him. Uh, and here's a picture of his grave in Rome. It's so frequently visited. People are always uh, bringing flowers to it. Uh, this is a um, quite dramatic sculpture. I think this is made in a small town somewhere uh, near the coast of uh, um, the east coast of Italy. And I, th I thought it was a quite dramatic because it shows him in prison and the prison walls and here he's working on his books and studying uh, even though he's you know in these dire conditions he was never healthy as i pointed out before and his prison years were really rough on him and here's a quote uh, from one of the people writing about it. it says his teeth fell out his digestive system collapsed so that he could no longer eat solid food he had convulsions when he vomited blood suffered headaches so violent that he beat his head against the walls of his cell. Uh, but yet he did his greatest work in these years. So to me, it shows that what he did is he just sort of took his misery and used it to fuel his determination and his discipline. And um, his being able to continue, it was his way of not surrendering. And... Uh, and remaining unbowed. Um, people have fought to get in better conditions and uh, many times a good effect and he supported these. But there was one thing he wouldn't do. He refused to appeal to Mussolini for mercy. He would appeal to him for early release, but he wouldn't put it in form of an appeal for mercy. So he remained, so finally they let, he was moved into a clinic because he was, you know, he was in such a pinch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, the date for his release from the clinic was April 21, 1937. But he was too ill to be moved. And so he died only six days later, on April 27. His um, sister-in-law, Tatiana, had smuggled out all the notebooks bit by bit. And uh, they were sent off to Moscow for safekeeping. Uh, Italy was still under fascist rule. After the war, the uh, Soviets uh, gave them back to Tagliati. Uh, after the war, Tagli went through them and began to publish them one by one in uh, UNITA. And by 1957, a selection uh, was published for the first time in English. And um, some of the stuff, both in Italian and English, uh, were gotten hold of by this guy. Um, some of you may not know him, but I did. This is Rudy Lutschke. Uh, he was the leader of the German SDS. And it, it wasn't didn't have any uh, formal connection with us, uh, but I, I mean we were, you know, examples of sort of the same worldwide rising. But the um, SDS uh, stood for German Socialist uh, Student Union. Uh, those are the initials in German. Um, and um, it had a lot of leaders, but Rudy, Red Rudy, that's what they called him. He was one of the most dynamic and eloquent. And um, uh, he could just, you know, he, he spoke one time to, to Parliament and it blew everybody away. But um, he had studied the writings of, of Gramsci. And um, he um, 
he, he was the one who came up with the word, the phrase, the long march through the institutions. And he was, they were having a big parliament argument in the German New Left about whether they uh, was called the extra, for or against the ex, what was called the extra parliamentary opposition. And uh, so some people thought they could, um, by building the extra parliamentary opposition, they could go around the parliament and still get to socialism. And Dutch argued against that. And he said there was no way around it. You had to you had to carry out the long march through the institutions. And he used a lot of Gromsky to, to back this up. And the term long march also comes from the Chinese, from uh, Mao Zedong, in the long march in China. And that was intentional on, on Dutch's part. But he, wa he wanted to show that when marching through the institutions didn't necessarily have to be done in an, you know, an utterly reformist way, that, that it could be done in a way that built revolutionary organization at the same time. So um, he eventually, they waged a huge campaign against the media in Germany. Uh, there was a particularly horrendous right-wing paper or magazine newspaper, I guess you could call it the Fox News of its day in Germany, called Der Springer. And, uh, and the German SDS um, uh, waged a campaign called Expropriate Springer. It was the, the title of the campaign to expropriate the newspaper. I have it uh, nationalized and taken over by the working class. And uh, in the course of that campaign, a right winger put a bullet in uh, uh, Rudy's brain. And uh, amazingly, he survived. And um, but his um, he was able to um, think well. Uh, but uh, he was physically harmed. You know, he he would never had the same physical presence that he used to have. And he continued on for a few more years, and he helped developed some of the thinking, early thinking of the Green Party uh, mm. in uh, Germany. Uh, his wife in particular was uh, active in what he went on after he died, and she went on to be a leader in the Green Party. But he was really one of my heroes back then. And uh, and uh, a bunch of us in New York, we set up what was called, we called the Praxis Axis in SDS, and we got ourselves a copy of this 1957 uh, translation of Gramsci and began to try to figure out what it meant for us. Um, some people did better than others, but I just understood slices of it at the time. And uh, I didn't really, uh, I, I understood what it meant in terms of the universities, but I didn't have a, you know, an all-sided uh, appreciation of it. But that's, so Gromsky's ideas, this is, this is one of the links that brought Gromsky's ideas into the new left in the 1960s, which also, in, you know, inspired people like I showed a picture I showed to the guy Stuart Hall, at the beginning of this and how Okomsky's ideas um, came into our movement and are still around to you know considerable extent today. So that's it. Uh, you have a big overview now, but uh, just yeah. to review quickly. Uh, you know, there's a lot of these concepts you're gonna to have to think about and apply critically. You have to, whenever you read the newspapers or watch the news on TV, you're gonna to have to think about hegemony, um, the blocks, the blocks that are uh, contending with each other, uh, how, uh, what's common sense, what's good sense in any given situation, how are we, uh, how are we doing in forming the uh, are we paying attention to the most important thing of all the building of the modern prince we can have all the the useful analysis from all the other stuff but if we don't pull it, pull together to build the modern prince uh, we're really missing the point of all uh, the enhanced analysis and that's finally i've just uh, my um, the key point i draw from gomsky is that he really democratizes Marxism. He takes it out of the studies in the hands of the erudite intellectuals and he brings it into the workers' schools and uh, study groups. And uh, he just enhances the role of democracy in building the, the revolutionary organization. 
not that he's against it. As I said, he's not against discipline or centralism, but he really wants, um, you know, I think he has a much more, he enhances the democratic side of all the different conceptions uh, that we've learned from official Marxism in the past. So I'll stop sharing my screen here and uh, we can have some discussion if you want. The floor is open. You've got a chat from um, Randy, I think. Oh. I have to open my chat. I forgot where it is. Oh, there it is. Oh, that's the name of the book. Uh, Gramsci's Common Sense by Kate Crehan. And uh, the, he, he, uh, Randy gave us the title of the two books. I think both, uh, Randy and I both think both of them are excellent. Uh, so uh, Kate, she zero, zeroes in on this whole question of uh, common sense. The other guy, he tries to, um, his idea is to apply Gromsky to the uprising in Egypt. But he spends the first half of the book just talking about summarizing Gromsky before he gets all that much into Egypt. And he does really an excellent job of it. So mm. Those are the strengths of those two books. The first half of uh, Gromsky on Tahrir, uh, he, the author, really um, does an excellent discussion of the development of capitalism and the class struggle through its various stages um, from a, a Gramscian viewpoint. So if, if you would like a Gramscian history of capitalism um, in, I don't know, 12 or 15 pages, this is really fantastic. And uh, he brings it right up to the present moment, um, which, at, you know, and all I can say is that um, he's really, really on the money. And of course, as Carl said, the second half of the book, he applies, you know, this um, analytical method to the revolution and counter-revolution in Egypt. Um, so, um, um, Rauch's Common Sense by Kate Crehan is a, is a very, very well researched and I would say somewhat complex um, discussion of the development of Gramsci's concept of common sense. Uh, she really breaks down all of the, the aspects of the development of this concept and, um, you know, looks at how it was um, developed. And then she applies that to several, I think to three uh, key political events um, in, in modern times. I know one of them is um, the um, Occupy movement. Right. And another one was uh, a, a right wing, I um, can't remember the- Tea Party. The Tea Party, yeah. Right. So, yeah, she's, uh, anyway, I, I highly recommend both of those books. Yeah, this is Tina. Hi, Tina. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, just to bring the whole Gramscian um, paradigm down to a more grassroots, everyday, um, like how it can be applied in everyday political organizing, um, I'd just like to, to talk a little bit about how it helped me. So I think as a leftist, when you're in, mainstream political mass organizing and, and work, you know, beside other activists. I think one of the things that you find yourself doing, and one thing I found myself doing, was exactly what Gramsci describes as the role of the organic intellectual, which is to be describing and reflecting back to your class the, the realities of the class. So it was so helpful to me because, you know, like over the past almost 30 years, I've been doing this work and, and trying to be beside 
um, pe people who are not Marxist and figure out my role and how I can help and contribute. And it often involved explaining things, uh, explaining my point of view of how I saw the same thing that they saw. And to have to read about Gramsci's explanation of the role of the organic intellectual just completely um, hit home to me. It was like having he like organically intellectualized it to me what my reality of what I was doing, and it was just so helpful to have a conceptual intellectual framework to think about what I had been been doing for all those years. And I just I it's, it was so great to have some. Like, like a little tool, a little handle to put on what I'd been doing. And that's what really turned me on with Gramsci and just made me want to explore more and learn more about what he had said and thought. Oh, that's right. When Gramsci always held a position that he wanted to educate the workers to understand who they were. And by that, he just didn't mean, well, I'm uh, Guido who uh, makes shoes over in the shoe factory. He wanted them to understand who he was more broadly uh, and the thing he would push push him and say well yeah you're a good shoemaker but you're more than a shoemaker and he would have, talk about the history his family's history and push him to think more and then he would get him to speak out speak about these things pressing and pushing for the wider context getting him to understand who he was so in that sense Gramsci's ideas here you know once removed help you to understand who you were that you had, you were, in fact, you could see yourself uh, being this organic intellectual. And then once you see who you were, it would enhance your ability to help other people understand who they were, step by step. You know, I forget who said it, but, you know, uh, one thing is that, uh, I'm, I don't know whether it came from Marx or Engels, I'm one of those guys. He said once, this is a, you know, when we recruit from the from the um, non-proletarian classes, we have to find ways to get people to be traitors to their class. He says, but when we yeah. educate mm -hmm. when we educate the working class, we just have to educate them as to who they are. <laughs> and mean right. by who they are, he meant in the deepest and widest sense that they were the grave diggers of capitalism. But so, so and have to... <laughs> and Paulo Paulo Freire was greatly influenced by. Yes. By Gramsci, um, upon rereading *Pedagogy of the Ex of the Oppressed*, after I had knew something about Gramsci, it was really remarkable to see how much Gramsci is in that right. that writing. And he acknowledged it too. Yeah. Right on. How about you, Barbara? What did you find helpful? Uh, well, you know, I, I've been thinking of, for example, in uh, one of the groups that I'm in, which isn't necessarily political, uh, what I've found is um, people have a lot of really uh, good political ideas and they're, you know, it's good to have them be able to talk about them, but it's it's other things that I find really difficult, like uh, they go along with this supreme hatred of uh, Russia and, you know, kind of like what they're fed on television. So I'm not, you, you know, I'm, I really don't know how to deal with that too much. Well, a, so we all have to work on that. One yeah. thing we have to know is that the, the Russia today is not the Russia that we yeah defended for yeah many that's years. right that's one thing and uh, but that still doesn't necessarily mean that, that uh, we need to buy into the fact that our that there are that we have to go wage war against them in an inner imperialist rivalry you know we have to oppose our own bourgeoisie and its escapades but uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, on the other hand uh, I mean the main thing is. Uh, I would say just to try to look at it realistically and mm -hmm. uh, not let old old ideas uh, get us trapped. But mm -hmm. there's two sets of old ideas. <laughs> <laughs> there's the old ideas of anti-communism and yeah. McCarthy, and then there's the old ideas of the British or whatever you want to call it. And we have to, we have to work right. with those. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and I think people bring out a lot of those really old ideas and those prejudices yeah. when in today's world. So it's it's hard. I find it hard. It's a hard period. Right. Janet, what did you get? Oh, my. Well, I was just thinking about that, you know, um, this whole idea of, uh, you know, there there's so much conflicted consciousness when you were talking yeah. about that. Um, um, people... People kind of parrot a lot of times what they hear on TV, you know, mm -hmm. uh, standard like like Barbara was saying. This, you know, this is um, this is what the problem is, etc. I mean, one example I've used a lot is, and maybe I've said this before to to some of you, but you know, we used to do a lot of door to door work in in Kentucky, and I remember going in and talking to a a, a, a older uh, black woman and ask her we were kind of like well what do you think of what what do you see as the main problems in your community and she just went on and on about the uh the, the young people standing out on the street and using drugs and uh -huh. you know causing trouble and and obviously that was something she was fearful of you know uh for around her own safety etc um and but then you know i said well what would it take, what do you think would change that? And all of a sudden she started thinking, well, if they had something to do, if there was recreation yeah. centers, if they were, you know, all of a sudden her whole, if they could get jobs, that was the first thing she said. Right. If they, if they could get jobs, this would be different and they can't, you know, so the whole, the whole conversation just totally switched. Um, just by, by, by raising that question. And that doesn't always work like that, though. But that's just the one time that really represented me, like uh, the people are really conflicted in what they think. I mean, they mm -hmm. have two sets of ideas. And, you know, uh, I think what we need to do is learn to, um, um, you know, bring, you know, bring the, the uh, the I guess uh, what what would be that that would be the good sense not the common sense out in people um, so um, that that'd be one thing and um, that's good and also people just learn in stages you know um, and uh, uh, things don't happen overnight you know <laughs> uh, waging a war position takes a while yeah we first started work with the sanitation workers in in lexington i remember uh they were already we had we had bills in um in the uh, uh state legislature and they were all i mean they all had wednesdays off none of them worked on wednesdays so we were to take bus loads of workers down to the state capitol on on wednesdays to demonstrate and lobby and do all this stuff and the the, the um um the uh, uh uh, congressman who introduced the bills came and talked to the workers and they said, no, you don't want to do that. You let me handle it. Mm. You don't want to go that. Yeah. I mean, that spoiled all our, our chances of doing that, but it didn't spoil it for the next year. <laughs> you know, they learned from that. And then the next year they were, they were ready to get active, but you know, it took that experience of seeing, uh, you know, and learning to understand that that was wrong. So it's just, it's a, such a sometimes frustrating, slow uh, process. Uh, sometimes it's hard to figure out how to get through it all. <laughs> Dan, are you still with us? I am. It's just my connection's been a little bit uh, uh, funky, I guess is the right way to say it. So I've been trying to, uh, I turned off the screen. So maybe I was, I was hoping that that would help the uh, video and sound come in word better. Yeah. So <clears throat> your final comments, do you have any? Oh, final comments. Oh, my God. No, but, you know, I, I've enjoyed, actually, this, this whole series. And, uh, uh, you, know, I, you know, especially the, the concept of hegemony, uh, uh, was it like a week ago or something like that? Yeah. And this topic of, of common sense. You know, and I, I you know, I, I'm thinking on the grander terms, but also then just, you know, my own little city here, how, how well, here in this city, it's interesting because just, just like in a lot of places, you know, the the sort of liberal kind of lefty types or whatever have gone over are, are more in the, the wealthier sections of the city. And then here in my own neighborhood, which tends to be more working class and, and uh, you know, especially the, the white section of the working class tends to be more, uh, uh, you know, in many ways uh, Republican and, and leaning against the, the progressives. 
And so, you know, this is something I've thought about, you know, at length, I mean, a lot. And, and I think that obviously Gramsci has, has a, a lot to say about that. Right. And so I've been, I've been thinking a lot about this concept of identity and um, that you raised just a little while ago and, and, and how that plays into it. And, and so I'm, I'm thinking a lot about that. There's one thing um, I saw the other day, I forget, forget what it was, but somebody was making a, a big polemic that the, for the Democratic Party to move forward, it had to take on identity politics. And, uh, and the idea was to bring up, uh, you know, replace it with economic concerns. Yeah. So I have no problem with, you know, bringing up economic concerns, but I posed a question to him. I said, I said, I might agree with you, but I said, I said, there's one identity politics that you need to put at the top of your list, which is white. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, exactly. that's my that's my point. That's a point I, I'm making about conflicted consciousness. Right. But take myself for example. You know, you know. On one hand, um, I come from a, a combination of a working class and small producer uh, background uh, here in uh, Western Pennsylvania, and uh, we're never all that. Uh, we we did all right, but you know. Uh, my dad had hard times, and his his family had hard times very, during the depression, and uh, so I developed a certain kind of uh, consciousness uh, around around that. I saw myself as uh, first of all, I saw myself as uh, as uh, as not on the upper end of the economic scale, and I saw myself as uh, white, uh, uh, something of a hillbilly greaser. <laughs> and um, I mean, these uh, these were all part of my identity. And mm -hmm. uh, um, when I went off to college, some of that changed, but some of it stuck with me. So I have, you know, I have a whole set of identities that, uh, and we, the point I think is that we all have them, and we all need to yeah. recognize them. So right. somebody's talking about identity politics as well. And the first question I asked them was, "Well, what's your identity?" You know? Are you a white person? Uh, and then I, I, that's a good question to argue about because um, biologically speaking, there is no white race. White mm -hmm. is a social construct. So uh, that's an identity and you know, to the extent that you, you think you are, that's an identity that you have or that you, are you, um, uh, you know, a, a worker or you're a producer of some sort uh, and so on There's, uh, or male even. I'm a man. I have, I've told this joke. It's not really a joke, but it's a lesson. You know, I had a girlfriend uh, 15, 20 years ago. We were in a huge fight one day. And uh, she said, Carl, you know what's wrong with you? You think you're a man. Huh. <laughs> you know, it took me six months to think of, and it stopped me in my in the middle of the argument, you know, <laughs> it took me six, six months to figure it out. And I did it by um, understanding, you know, the, you know, how I was white and the white skin privilege, you know, and uh, it was, it got me to think about how maleness is a, is a social mm -hmm. construct too. I mean, it's anchored more in biology, but it's right. still the social role the of masculinity and all that. You know, mm -hmm. It took me it took me six months to get to it, but it was a valuable lesson <laughs> not to think so much as a man, you know. Um, and uh, so um, I think uh, what Gramsci that's that's the importance of conflicted consciousness versus false consciousness. You know, we talk about the workers having false consciousness. It's like it's a problem that's outside of us. And this is they've got this disease, and we're the doctors, and we're going to go in there and cure it. But Gramsci democratizes the whole thing with the idea of conflicted consciousness. We all share this problem in different ways, and uh, so we we can make common ground with the people who have conflicted consciousness, and then we can work on it as a joint project in trying to overcome it. That's, uh, if, if I may, I, I think that. Um... The, an important aspect of the development of consciousness is in struggle. Yes. And, um, and it's much more effective than 
um, the tendency toward, you know, looking in the mirror and thinking about yourself. I mean, I've done a lot of that, but um, I just want to just point out a couple of things. First of all, is the um, tremendous growth in consciousness of high school students around the shootings. Um, you see now that all of a sudden, a subaltern group has taken um, the headlines and leadership in the community of resistance to uh, right-wing proto-fascist um, traditions, um, the Second Amendment, the right to own tanks, missiles, automatic weapons, whatever you can afford to buy. Um, and I, I also just want to just briefly talk about an experience I had when I was uh, living in Nashville. I was a volunteer organizer for the National Welfare Rights Organization and worked with mostly African-American women who were very, very poor um, um, in, in Nashville. And um, of course, I was also working on the Free Angela Davis campaign. So there was, there was a lot of things going on. Um, but uh, a state representative from uh, West Tennessee, the farm country outside of Memphis, introduced a bill that uh, any woman on welfare would be sterilized after two children. Mm. Um, so, you know, we kind of got together and, you know, um, with some persuasion and a lot of driving around, you know, because none of these people had cars, we agreed to meet uh, at the Capitol uh, where they were this committee was uh, discussing this bill. And, uh, you know, these people were very kind of retiring, uh, somewhat shy and um, not used to challenging authority, and maybe had never challenged authority. But we had about 15 um, people, I would say like maybe 12 or 13 were women and a couple guys all African-Americans. And when they got in the Capitol halls, there was this <laughs> amazing transformation um, because they started yelling at the um, representatives and they got louder and they started threatening them with physical harm, like, you know, dismembering them. <laughs> And the, the chairman just uh, uh, adjourned the meeting and they actually ran out of the room down the hall. Um, <laughs> because of, uh, there was just like a, and it, so this would not have happened um, on the part of any individual, say who had gone to the meeting and sat there, but because it was a group uh, with common experience and because of, our work, um, a common understanding of what was going on and why it was wrong. I mean, it was self-evident wrong, but um, so, you know, that was, those people were changed forever and they became actors in, in their own fate to a much greater degree um, that, than they had before. Well, that's the, the little um, button I showed you, praxis, action, reflection, theory. Mm -hmm the circular process, that's the process that we want to engage in, you know, and it's best to start by doing something and then uh, reflecting on it and then, you know. That's why our, our PDA group here, um, we're always involved in organizing some kind of action. Right. And uh, it, that's what really builds. Right. Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, um, and, and this would be something. I mean, now I'll call you back. I'm on another line. Um, I'll call you back. Okay. Um, it would be good to reflect on, like, what well, you and Randy and Tina's experiences there, et cetera. 
I'm just having all these women that have really gotten active in these groups, you know, in here from in Lawrence County and Mercer County in, uh, in um, um, Slippery Rock, you know, uh, it's just really impressive, but there's not, um, you know, how you, it's really hard for me to figure out how to work with that consciousness of, I mean, a lot of them were, were just became outraged because of the Trump election. But there's, you know, um, you know, the I don't I don't know how to explain it, but it it, it just, it's I find it difficult to figure out how to to work in that situation to to move things forward. Uh, well, they're in motion, but they still have conflicted consciousness. Right. Yeah. And, so we, I think what we we have to find a ways to connect them to different um, instruments that we do have, which are kind of primitive. We don't really have a full-blown modern prince, mm -hmm. but we do have things like Beaver County Blue that we can make better use of, and uh, and uh, you know we have a modern zygote. <laughs> modern <laughs> zygote. <laughs> we have to grow it some more. We have to get uh, better on our uh, public uh, faces for our radical education and so on. But but we can work on it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, it's going to be a challenge like everything else is, but we will get it. Uh, we will get it rolling. So now we have three classes, our can these, and uh, put links uh, to them up on the uh, online university of the left. And uh, uh, I set up a new thing today, or actually I set it up a couple of days ago, uh, to try to make the online university of the left more participatory. And uh, I've discovered this uh, uh, software called Mighty Networks. And uh, what it is, it's a, it's a kind of miniature Facebook that you create of your own. And uh, it does all the same stuff as a Facebook. Facebook. You can comment and you can share pictures and articles and back and forth there. But, you, but Facebook has two billion users, but uh, hmm. you have to build your own user base. But you know, they sort of explain how to do about how to go about it growing and, and social networking. On two days, I've got about 20 members on it now, and um, from all over the world, actually. Um, and it just keeps growing. So I'm going to uh, keep working on it. But I think that um, PDA, our local PDA chapter, might be interested in, in doing this as a, or at least look into it as a way to, that we can hook it to uh, Facebook and uh, and our uh, Beaver County Blue, and we can build a, we can build a, a network. Uh, this way uh, that gives people a more a way to participate much more easy than putting them on a list serve mm -hmm. the idea is in in th theoretical terms uh, the usual instruments we have is one to many uh, you know you have a center and it controls everything and then it goes out to many but this little mighty networks thing is called many to many and so it, it encourages participation more and it makes it a lot easier than uh and just um you know, getting email blast uh, makes it much easier to be interactive and uh, to get encourage other people to recruit other people to join it. So I'm going to try it out and see how it works. But I think it would be uh, well for other because I, th I think if we do get to the modern prince, this will be the core. This kind of structure uh, will be the core of it. Uh, so it's, it's worth looking at in terms of building organization. Mm -hmm. I, I think I, I uh, want to always emphasize that, you know, the core of Gromsky's teaching was trying to, so we have to figure out the modern prince for the 21st century and, uh, and, uh, and work on uh, uh, getting it all together. So it's getting kind of late, guys. It's uh, it's uh, uh, two hours. Uh, we got a little late getting started, but uh, let's uh, call an end to it. And uh, we'll get these things canned and uh, up on the online university left. So I want to encourage any of your other friends that they want uh, to do uh, the study group, either just by playing the, the, the tapes that we have, the recordings that we have. Mm -hmm. But if, if you can get, get a, 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 some organization or whatever wants to get a batch of people together, like say the East Bay DSA, they have what, about 800 members that they want to get, you know, mm -hmm. two dozen of them together, I'll, I'll do the class. Uh, live for them again if they want uh, okay. and uh, 
And so we'll, we'll keep plugging away with it. Okay. All right. Uh, All right. Thank you very much. Yes, All right. it's great to see you. Uh, All right. Very good. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Kyle. Thank you. thank you guys for taking part. And uh, yeah. you know, I'm sure we'll be connected one way or another um, right. going forward. Carry thank on. Thank you. Bye -bye. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Yeah.